In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What is truth? asks Pilate. A sort of odd philosophical note, considering the circumstances. It's even more odd coming from a man whose reputation for violence was even controversial amongst his Roman peers. And remember, this is a culture that quite literally watched people kill each other for entertainment. What is truth? A genuine question? Or a bit of cynicism? Within the narrative of the Passion, the account of Jesus' trial and torture in the fourth Gospel stands out among the other accounts. This is not at all the synoptic scene of Jesus standing silent before Pilate and his accusers. Rather, biblical scholar Raymond Brown writes, it is an elaborate front and backstage setting with the Jewish priests in the crowd outside, Jesus inside, and Pilate shuttling back and forth between them. As he moves from one stage to the other, Pilate is like a chameleon, taking on the different coloration of the parties who engage him. Outside, there is ceaseless pressure, conniving, and outcry. Inside, there is calm and penetrating dialogue. Unlike the synoptic accounts, Jesus eloquently converses with this man of power. When accused of being a king, the already mocked and beaten up Jesus will not refuse the title, Brown writes, but points out that the real reason he came into the world was not to be a king, but rather it is to bear witness to the truth. For this I was born, says Jesus, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. As we move through the scene, you might start to get the feeling that Jesus is not really the one on trial here. Instead, it is Pilate who is put on trial to see whether he is of the truth. Pilate may think he has the power to try Jesus, but he is calmly told that he has no independent authority over Jesus. It is not Jesus who fears Pilate. It is Pilate who is afraid of Jesus. The real question in this scene in John's Gospel is not what will happen to Jesus, who controls his own destiny, but whether Pilate will betray himself by bowing to the outcry of the very people he is supposed to govern. We see that Pilate comes to see the truth about Jesus, but fails to bear witness to it as he washes his hands in the synoptics and sends Jesus off to be killed. The truth is there for Pilate to see, and he turns his back. Perhaps for political expediency, perhaps because of apathy. Maybe a little of both. Recent decades have seen an interesting reaction towards the idea of truth. It's been building for centuries, really. A veil of suspicion is thrown over everything. And yet, we crave equally to know what is real and to be able to only give voice to that which will apparently benefit us. The very idea of whether truth can be known is treated with suspicion. 
we hear people talk of their truth, his truth, her truth, my truth, your truth. But anyone who claims to be able to tell the truth is treated as fishy at best. Along with the idea that nobody could give witness to the entire truth of a matter, or perhaps what we might call the absolute truth, the idea was perhaps a noble one that the truth could be approached from different angles and is not the property of the powerful to impose on others. This perhaps worked until someone worked out, or some people worked out, that you could game this system and broadcast anything you like as truth. And so we enter a new realm of fake news and alternate facts. And the words lie or liars are dispensed with. We then get to the point where those who seek truth and then try to speak the truth are mocked and ridiculed. When the concept of truth is a free-for-all and to be determined as to what will apparently get you the fame, security or power you want, then we have simply arrived back with Pilate washing his hands. For this I came into the world to testify to the truth, Jesus says. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The word truth is mentioned 21 times in John's Gospel. Way back at the beginning of the Gospel, we hear about the, inca we hear about the incarnation that the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory is of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. And later in that chapter, it says, The law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus the Messiah. In chapter 4, Jesus says that those who worship the Father must worship him in spirit and truth. And in chapter 8, Jesus says to those who believe in him, who are called to be truth-tellers, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Jesus names the evil one as the father of lies and that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who will be sent to guide the disciples into all truth. At the Last Supper, Jesus speaks of himself as the way, the truth and the life and prays that the Father will sanctify his disciples in the truth. Now here, bef now here before he is sent out to be mocked, flogged and crowned with thorns, Jesus says that those who belong to the truth listen to his voice. Truth is not always easy to listen to, and therefore is often avoided. Perhaps as we reflect on the truth of Good Friday today, we can also consider the truth that we might have considered more convenient to ignore. The truth about ourselves, the truth about our relationships, the truth about our society, the truth about climate change, the truth about race relations in this country. The truth about invasion and racism. 
and exploitation. The truth about how women are so often treated. And we also think of the heart of this day. The truth of the cross. Why it happened and what it brings. Though Pilate turned his back on it, the truth was staring him in the face and speaking to him. The truth of Good Friday is of creation rescued and renewed. Anglican author Samuel Wells writes that the crucifixion is what happens when the profound and utter goodness of God comes face to face with the fickle and faithless machination of humankind. The truth of Good Friday is that in the crucifixion, God's unimaginably great love for us is shown. At the Last Supper, Jesus taught that true godly love is self-sacrifice for others' good. And here, he enacts this love by dying on the cross. This ultimate self-sacrifice for the healing of creation. Theologian James Allison reminds us that what we remember today is not the story of some Aztec-like God who needs blood to be happy. The story of the passion is done out of love. The God who created the world, who knits us together in the womb, sings stars into life and feeds and sustains all life, shows us not that he is angry, but that he loves us. We are angry. We hate. We think we need victims to punish to make us feel better. God wants to love us. Perfectly human and perfectly divine. Jesus walks the road to Golgotha to extinguish our apathy, violence and hate, not his. Amongst the whips, the fists and the nails, he does it for us. God takes us at our very worst and here shows how far God goes for our salvation. The truth of Good Friday is that God is love. It is done for us and it shows us the way and the truth and the life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.